We're going to start this episode with sort of a ghost story from the Ozarks. But don't worry, it's not really scary or anything, more mysterious. I want you to meet Steve Bost. Yeah, Steve's fine. So Steve is an avid Missouri wilderness man. He loves to hunt and hike. Since about the 1970s, he would make his way down to the Ozarks to camp and enjoy nature. And he'd tend to meet up with an old friend, Harold Adams, who knew the area well. And he began to tell me about this tree that grew and the nuts were so delicious to eat. He said they were the sweetest nut you could ever imagine. Harold was telling Steve about the Ozark chinkapin, also known as the Ozark chestnut. In all his years, Steve had never even heard of this tree. I was really intrigued by all this. So one thing led to another. And so every fall when I'd go back up there to camp out, I would uh, visit with him some more and find out more about this tree. Steve learned that, like its cousin, the iconic American chestnut, the Ozark chinkapin used to be all over the Ozark region and beyond. Its natural range spread from beyond Missouri, east to the coast, south into Mississippi and Alabama, and west into Oklahoma and Texas. Around the 1930s, though, the Ozark chinkapin and the American chestnut began to disappear, killed off by blight. The blight was this disease caused by a fungus. Swollen and cracked cankers would attack the limbs and eventually kill off the entire tree. Over the next few decades, an estimated 4 billion American chestnuts and millions of Ozark chinkapins died off. By the 1970s, most people thought the Ozark chinkapin was extinct. Steve Boss spent decades visiting his Ozark friend, Harold, every fall in the woods, learning about this tree until about two years ago. He passed away. He was uh, just a few weeks shy of 100 years old. And so I was a man on a mission to find this tree. <laughs> now, I should tell you a little more about Steve Boss. Steve is originally from the Boot Hill area of Missouri. He grew up gardening, hunting, and foraging. By the mid-90s, he was working as a naturalist at Missouri State Parks. So he was, one, really surprised to learn about the tree for the first time from Harold, and then, two, became obsessed with finding one for himself. And I kept finding bits of information about it, and three experts told me, they said, you are wasting your time and are on a ghost hunt. The tree you're looking for no longer exists. All you're going to find is blighted stump sprouts. But Steve didn't buy it. He was convinced that there still had to be some out there. He set out on that ghost hunt to bring the Ozark chinkapin back from the dead. From KCUR Studios in Kansas City and the Missouri Humanities Council, this is Hungry for Mo, a podcast about the stories behind the iconic foods that shape our region. I'm Natasha Bailey. And I'm Jenny Vergara. This episode, we're diving into the Ozarks and Ozark cuisine. Like the chinkapin, Ozark food is a thing that not many people really know about. It's kind of ignored, maybe even misunderstood. But the truth about this cuisine is hiding somewhere in the Ozark wilderness, waiting for people to share it and tell its story. Luckily, there's plenty of Ozarkers putting in the legwork, advocating for the people and the nature of their region to get their due. All right, Jenny, here we go. I'm excited. Jenny, this podcast, Hungry for Mo, is all about how iconic food shaped our region. But we're kind of flipping it around this time because we're looking at what the land can teach us. We're exploring indigenous food traditions of a very unique and special part of the state, the Ozarks. Okay, headed to the Ozarks. Headed to the Ozarks. Is it family vacation time? Is it time to swim in the water and rent a boat or have a jet ski? Oh, so you've been to the Ozarks. I have been to the Ozarks. Okay. Uh, the, par- I... the party part of the Ozarks. <laughs> Maybe not the foraging forest of the Ozarks. <laughs> We're going to go to foraging today. Okay. <laughs> so when I say Ozarks, what do you think of? You can't help but notice like these rolling hills as you're going to it. And it is very pic- picturesque. I mean, beautiful. And then, of course, all the water features that we all know on the Lake of the Ozarks, right? We're all kind of familiar with that. So... That and, you know, a good hamburger joint, maybe a go-kart spot, a little fried chicken sandwich somewhere in there. That is the Pizza. Perfect, perfect segue because I was going to ask you, when I say Ozark cuisine, what do you think? I don't know that I know what Ozark cuisine is. I really don't. 
I felt the same way. When The more we were researching, the more I realized that my idea of what Ozark cuisine is, it was way off. Mm -hmm. It was way off. So let's start with a little lesson about the Ozarks. The Ozarks are sometimes also referred to as the Ozark Mountains and Ozark Plateau. They're a physiographic, geologic, and cultural highland area in the United States. They cover most of the southern half of Missouri and northern Arkansas. And they span into northeast Oklahoma and the extreme southeast part of Kansas. The Ozarks are known for their natural elements, the sparkling springs, lush forests, waterfalls, and caves. And a lot of tourists flock to the man-made parts, like the Lake of the Ozarks and Silver Dollar City in Branson, Missouri. Nobody knows for certain where the name Ozarks comes from, but one theory is that it's derived from the early French explorer's description of the Quapaw, an indigenous tribe who used bows and lived in the area now known as Arkansas, Aux Arcs, which means of bows. In addition to the Quapaw, the Osage and many other indigenous tribes are connected to the area, the Caddo, Delaware, Cherokee, and Kickapoo, just to name a few. Eventually, all the native tribes were displaced and pushed out of the area by European settlers, a process that sped up after the Louisiana Purchase. Many of these newcomers were of Scotch-Irish descent who came out west from Appalachia. The area also attracted families with German and French roots. So that admittedly, very generally, explains the basic history of the peoples connected to the Ozarks. As a region, cuisine is not the first thing that comes to mind, but there is a chef who has been trying to change that recently, Rob Connolly, who runs the restaurant Bull Rush in St. Louis, Missouri. I've heard of this. You've heard of this. What have you heard of this? So I actually haven't talked to this chef, but um, we did quite a few stories at when I was with Feast Magazine featuring him and kind of his mission to bring back kind of upscale Ozark cuisine. He was really getting it done. I mean, he had a passion for it and was foraging for it and really, really making it his life's mission. So that's generally what I know about him. But I've never eaten at the restaurant. I'd love to. Oh, I would love to eat there as well. And you hit the nail on the head. Ozark food is tapping into and and manifesting the culture of the Ozarks. Okay, that's pretty loosey-goosey. And so I, I, I'll say for me, that means living off the land, hunting, sustenance, farming, using everything of the plant and of the animal, curing, pickling, you know, storing through the winter, keeping your pickle cellar up. This is Ozark food. Now, that's no different than Appalachia or many other places. But the land here, the region that we're talking about, is isolated, especially the time period that we're looking at. Rob Connolly opened Bull Rush in 2019. He says the food they serve is rooted in Ozark cuisine, and specifically from the time period between the late 18th to the early 19th century. And so those things that I just listed have a much more significant meaning than if we just flippantly say that. The first thing Rob himself will tell you is that he's not Native American or from the Ozarks. When people reach out to me about indigenous food, um, I very quickly put out the disclaimer, the caveat that, look, I'm not indigenous. It's not my story to tell. Um, the way we tell the story here at the restaurant is we bring in guest chefs who are indigenous. Rob grew up in St. Louis, but the work of exploring this beautiful place through history and the food growing here is a passion and something he takes very seriously and with a lot of care. You've got to represent the place and the people and the time, and you've got to do it right. Rob says their food incorporates influences from the American Indian tribes of the Ozarks, free and enslaved African Americans, early settlers, and the land that connected all these people. Wild ingredients are a central part of Rob's menu. Especially right now, foraging is so trendy. It has been for a long time, of course, but it's gaining a certain momentum right now. There's a few uh, social media influencers or stars that are out there that I really love. I would love to see people get off the industrialized food system and have a, a little self-sustainability. Bull Rush is always putting creative spins on their dishes, and their presentations look like pieces of art. Things like a pecan milk tofu, winter squash consomme with Missouri rice flour, marigolds and cattail pollen, a dish that looks like a spirograph or snowflake, mouth-watering oyster mushroom quiche baked to perfection, pickled elderberries, 
Mulberry Italian Meringue. Rob was actually a semifinalist for a James Beard Award this year for Best Chef in the Midwest. Even still, he's found that the Ozarks and Ozark food remain shrouded with this unfair stigma. So few people, one, even know what the Ozarks are, even people in Missouri, two, certainly don't know what Ozark food is, and three, uh, I, I ask this every time I am allowed to talk, I say, give me one positive portrayal of the Ozarks in pop culture or mass media. I have asked that hundreds and hundreds of times, even at presentations in the Ozarks, and you cannot give me an answer. You'll give me Jason Bateman, you'll give me Winter's Bone. Most people say that um, the Beverly Hillbillies were Ozark, and for the old timers who like to read the, the funny pages in newspapers, you'll remember Lil Abner. All of these negative stereotypes, all of these negative tropes have their origin in Shepherd of the Hills that famous book from the turn of the last century. And so we have this stigma. Shepherd of the Hills was a book written in the early 1900s, and it was eventually adapted into a film featuring John Wayne. The book is a story about forgiveness, but over time it's been exaggerated and even tokenized by some Ozarkers themselves as a way to stereotype Ozark culture. The author did not intend it to be a negative book. He was just telling the, his experiences of the people who were living off the land and doing these weird customs, weird by his standards. And over time, that's never stopped. Things that kind of sensationalize the backwoods nature of the area, like cookbooks with grandma in the rocking chair smoking a pipe, hailing recipes of baked raccoon and possum, made to sell to tourists. And that's not to say Ozarkers weren't eating those things. It's just that that wasn't all they were eating. The cuisine went a lot deeper. Rob's whole approach to focus on the land and that specific time period, he hopes will cut through stereotyping. He's done extensive research digging up firsthand accounts of Ozark life. At the restaurant, I'm retelling stories of people from the past. So I do a lot of work in archives, looking at letters and journals from people uh, from the late 18th, early 19th century. And then uh, based on what they're saying in those letters and journals, I tell their story through a plate of food. He helped me discover how the indigenous foods that grow in our region can shape our food and keep stories alive. So, Jenny, when you think of foraging, what are some of the foods that you think about that are native to here? Ramps and morel mushrooms and black walnuts. And I'm sure there's others. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's plenty of others. But I'm, that's about the extent of my knowledge. Have you ever heard of things that can kill you when you're foraging out in the wild? Well, mushrooms, right? Infamously. I mean, if you go to any of the, I kind of looked into foraging for a, a minute. I thought, yeah, that might be kind of fun. And I got so scared reading the Missouri Conservation <laughs> website that was like, do not eat if, you know, mushrooms can look the same. This one might be deadly. This one might be fine. And I thought, I'm scared. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that I know enough to know which is which. And that is good because when I was talking to Rob, he said people are scared, you yeah. know? Go out with a group. Mm -hmm. Education is the theme that runs through. The more that we educate ourselves on the land, the better we know how to use it. I remember thinking I would like to go with an expert to kind of... I did take my son, who he was probably four, at the four or five at the time, Foraging for morels. I had been told that close to my neighborhood there was a spot. I had heard this through the grapevine, talking to chefs in town. And we would got dressed up in our hiking gear, and I brought a little bag, and we tromped around the woods for hours, hours, and all we got were ticks. <laughs> so, sadly, no morels. What's something that grows here that not many people know about? Wow, I think that's a lot of things. Um, I, I'm always serving customers things that people uh, don't realize are out there. You know, and here's a super obvious one that I think more people know than don't. Uh, but when I serve pawpaw, which is like every night, people say, well, how do you even find pawpaw? I'm like, how do you not find pawpaw? <laughs> if you go in the woods, <laughs> you're going to smell it. Uh, if All you have to do is walk on the woods the last week in August, first two weeks in September, you will smell the alcohol in the air. You might even see some drunk raccoons you will find the pawpaw. It is out there. I love um, spice bush. Most of the seasoning we do at the restaurant is with spice bush. 
and we use all parts of it. Ooh, I actually do know a little bit about spice bush. Tell me. Okay, so do you know Linda Hetzel? Yes. Okay. Oh my gosh. She owns Prairie Birthday Farms here in Kansas City, and she was the one that actually mentioned Rob to me. And I had the opportunity to go to her farm and have her just walk me through her backyard. And she pointed to the spice bush and she said, you know, there's a lot of things you can do with this. She said the leaves can be, you know, there's a definite fragrance to them of kind of nutmeg and spice. And I thought, she, what is she? T- no. <laughs> and I'm telling you, we all, we were, I was a big group of us that were out there invited to do this with her. And I put some of those spice, spice bush leaves in my basket because we all had these foraging baskets, right? So we could be professional about it. And I went home and I steeped mine in whole milk and made a custard. And it tasted like my entire spice rack had been dumped into it. was the most delicious kind of chai-like, you know, kind of all the flavor, the flavors that are in chai, all the different spices. It was really good. You foraged and made a pie. I did. I know more about forging than I thought I did. You do. Well, anyway, I love what Rob's doing, and I think this is really, really interesting and really powerful about, you know, I think more chefs are starting to get interested in preserving the flavors of the place that they cook in, right? I can tell you there's no restaurant who is as hardcore as us for not using purchased spices. Part of that is I'm cheap and I like free spices, and the other part is the story I get to tell, you know, there are spices in our woods. Um, we we use bergamot. Bergamot is not the orange bergamot, the mint bergamot, which is all over the Ozarks in Missouri. Um, and we dry it out and it's an amazing seasoning or spice for us. There's a bunch of things like that. He is adamant about not wasting food. There is zero waste restaurant, so he's constantly being creative and trying new things with all parts of the cooking process. He even mentioned tasking his bar staff with making a cocktail out of boiled sweet potato water. Wait a minute. Boiled sweet potato water. Boiled sweet potato water. It takes a lot of booze to make that taste good in a cocktail. a lot of sugar, right? You can make a syrup. okay, all right. I've taught him how to take on these challenges How do you make a cocktail with roasted sweet potato water? Well, I don't know. What would you put on sweet potatoes? I would do pecans. I would do marshmallows. I would do maple syrup. Uh, And so they figure it out. So they they do things like brown butter washed Missouri bourbon with the the roasted uh, sweet potato water. And maybe, uh, I don't know, they'll put a sprinkle on the, the rim of the glass of um, spice bush salt. I don't know. They're really good at coming up with stuff like that. I love it. Being creative with what you have and using it all responsibly. The more research I did about the Ozarks, the more the vinegar pie kept coming up over and over again. What can you tell us about the Ozarks vinegar pie? Well, you know, that's not part of my family history. So I had to do the research on that. And I saw... Uh, A number of recipes. I've probably got, I don't know, maybe a dozen different ones, including different styles, but they're all born out of poverty. So let me, let me put in the basic term. If I wanted to, and I have no money, I could um, take water, thicken it with cornstarch, add some sugar and put it in a pie shell, right? And there you go. You have a custard pie. A vinegar pie is basically that with some vinegar. And there are different styles. Some people do cornstarch, some do egg yolks. Uh, I think the cornstarch is the, from the research, seems to be the more uh, common one, historically speaking. But that's all it is. Water, sugar, vinegar, and cornstarch cooked into a a thick slurry, poured into a pre-baked pie shell and allowed to chill. And then it's up to you to be as creative or not creative as you want. Um, We make our own vinegars. So my favorite one to make is uh, a pawpaw vinegar pie. Uh, you get a little tropical fruitiness to go with it. We've done black walnut vinegar pie, and um, we even did a, a sorghum vinegar pie where we take the sorghum, turn it into a vinegar, and then make the pie. There's all sorts of ways of doing that. 
I like the way that Rob explained it because sometimes if you just didn't have a lot of ingredients, a lot of money, this pie could be very satisfying and get you through. Absolutely. I, w- I did a deep dive on vinegar pie not that long ago, and I made a couple different ones because I thought, I don't quite understand what the flavor of this is, right? But it really is just makes like this most beautiful kind of, okay, if I had to describe it, I would say it's like pecan pie without the pecans. Like yeah. Kind of a sweet custard. And I think it's more common um, in in and around these parts than anywhere else. To me, it represents that resourcefulness and creativity you gotta have. That's a big part of Ozark cuisine, using what you have and making the best of it. And Rob is championing all this in the way he runs his restaurant. But that's still a very fine dining setting. In just a moment, I want you to meet someone who is making all these ideas accessible for every member of her community. Michelle, what is food sovereignty? My name's Michelle Bowden. I am a member of the Quapaw Nation here in Northeast Oklahoma. Um, I also work for uh, the nation as the Food Sovereignty Director. Food sovereignty means to me just that we're going to take control of the food systems. Quapaw, Oklahoma is in the northeastern corner of the state, where the tribe was forcibly removed to in the early 1800s. A few years ago, Michelle worked with her tribe to do a food sovereignty assessment. They found that their community, which is primarily lower income, was lacking access to healthy, fresh foods. So they got to work, opening a farmer's market on the main strip of town, creating a food hub as a year-round grocery option, and building a large garden so they could bridge the gap. So we really need to work on our own sovereignty and able to be able to produce foods and be able to give them back to our community and our people to try to, you know, alleviate some of the problems that we're having right now with inflation and the pandemic came through. And and I think people didn't realize the fact that we are in in such a fragile state of food security. Michelle Bowden grew up in Tulsa, but moved here to be closer to family and to take this on. Her number one goal is to make healthy food possible for everyone. Like a lot of Ozarkers we talked to, Michelle loves foraging. And the market teaches classes and offers supplies to help people grow and preserve their own food. Also, you know, dehydrating, you can't go wrong with uh, making a little jerky sometimes. So, yeah, pretty much anything and everything we can preserve is, is well worth it. Because even if it's not usable right now at this season, you still have it available, you know, a couple of months down the road. When you need it. Mm hmm. What does it mean to you to be self sustaining? That means that we don't have to rely on anybody else to be able to survive and thrive. We're, we're here to take care of our community. You know, when people are secure in food, it's one of those things that if, when you're secure in food, everything else will kind of fall into place. But unfortunately, which is kind of crazy to me, we live in the United States of America and we still have people that are hungry. It, it saddens me, but I also see positive future when we start teaching everyone how to, you know, grow their own food and how to preserve it and how to live on it, whether it be living off the land, you know, utilize every part of everything. What does your community mean to you? Like the community of the town or the community of our tribal, like community? Both. I think both is important because you have an impact on both communities. I mean, what you're doing, it helps everyone just have a better life. And I want to get that across. Sometimes a good meal can go a long way. Yes, and and food brings people together. That's the one thing. It's it's more of an emotional, physical, all kinds of healing together. And, And that's really what I'm trying to do is put that out to our community. We have tribal members that live there. We also have just members of the town that live there. And I just want to make sure that everybody has the accessibility to be able to get fresh product as well as not have to pay an arm and a leg. The Quapaw Nation even operates their own cattle company, raising hormone-free beef and bison, which was once a staple of American Indian life and a huge part of their culture. And Michelle recently acquired seeds from another tribe seed bank and was able to bring back and grow traditional Quapaw red corn. I'm so happy to go back and be able to work for my tribe in a field that I feel very passionate about. In the works are efforts to expand their bee raising operation, plant orchards and berry bushes, and continue to work in their new high tunnels, which means they can grow more produce year round. Michelle hopes someday they can make a mobile market so they can expand their services to the elderly and go into schools. I'm kind of looking at the sky's the limit personally. 
I see this as another part of what defines the Ozarks and its food, that drive to survive and thrive, a perseverance of spirit. Which brings us back to the ghost story we started with. Steve Boss search for the mysterious Ozark chinkapin in the Missouri wilderness. I walk, I like to walk and explore. Uh, in fact, exploring and being inspired are two of my biggest favorite things, I guess. Anyhow, so uh, I burned up a lot of shoe leather and driven thousands of miles looking for these trees. He spent a decade researching this tree in libraries and online, asking his wildlife connections and just putting boots on the ground. Nothing. Until the winter of 2006, when he finally found a lead. A hunter who said he knew about some Ozark chinkapin trees near the Arkansas and Missouri border. It was cold, rainy, a day full of mishaps that Steve would rather forget about. But the payoff was worth it. They set out to hike in the mountains, and right before dark, they arrived to the spot, and the rain let up. And so he took me out to this area where there's these huge, gigantic logs laying everywhere. And there were stump sprouts of diseased trees, and they'd gone in and logged this area, and sunlight was coming in. So some of them were blooming, but there were no big trees. And he had found a tree that was about eight inches diameter. At last, an Ozark chinkapin specimen that had survived the blight. It was the first one Steve had ever seen in his life. Then, of course, Steve set off to find even more. Well, the next thing you know, Steve is aware of it, and he becomes Johnny Appleseed for the Ozark Chinkapin. A.J. Hendershot works for the Missouri Department of Conservation, and he's the vice president of the Ozark Chinkapin Foundation, which is an organization Steve Boss created. It's dedicated to restoring the species through a comprehensive breeding program, working with various scientists, conservation groups, and dependent on the help of citizen scientists. A.J. Hendershot says their success has been largely driven by Steve's ability to make people hungry to get involved. He would talk to you about this, and if you got pretty excited and it looked like you were really interested, he would say, hey, do you want to be a part of this? And the great thing about it is you you taste one nut, and you're going to say, we've got to bring this tree back. The chinkapin nut is delicious, even when eaten raw. It's very sweet, with almondy peanut notes and a lingering, pleasant aftertaste. And some say... They're even tastier when roasted. They're also really easy to crack open and packed with protein. I like to look at ecology as a symphony. The more instruments you have in the symphony, the sweeter the music. If you remove a particular instrument group, the music goes on. But that doesn't mean it's as sweet. So if we lose any particular species, whatever they contribute to the ecology of your system, whether you understand it or it's so subtle, that we don't understand it, you're still losing parts. So when I look at any species, whether it's the Ozark chinkapin or some fish or a butterfly or, uh, you know, a flower, it's important. Thanks to those breeding efforts, the foundation says they have about 100 large trees they are growing that are resistant to blight. They even send out chinkapin seeds to members so that more trees will be planted across the region. There is still a long way to go. But Steve says each time a new person learns about this almost forgotten tree and how important it is to the Ozarks, it's a step in the right direction. Trees can't talk, so it's up to us, you know, people like me and and AJ and the other people I work with to keep attention on this. One of the people who's helping with the cause of the Ozark chinkapin, Rob Connolly at Bullrush. A few weeks out of the year, he serves chinkapin nuts on his menu. Oh, he actually can get his hands on some. Get his hands on some. Okay. Right now on the menu, I have a chinkapin chestnut mousse. It's served with acorn shortbread and sorghum cake, along with candied sunflower seeds. And that's the dessert that we end our meal with. Rob totally gets that this is a seasonal, very special treat that needs to be harvested responsibly, of course, and shared with intention. Serving the Ozark chinkapin in his restaurant is an important piece of the puzzle, He's opening people's eyes, mouths, and more importantly, their hearts to it in a very intimate way. You got to create a market for it. And I, I think all these rare things are are similar. When people show interest, that's when innovation happens and effort gets put into them uh, to make them actually grow and, and be more in, in our kitchens. Rob says that's what motivates him to do this kind of work, seeing how this food, the food of the Ozarks has gotten through to people. 
he shared this story about a guy who emailed him a while back. He emailed me and said, you don't know me, uh, but I'm born and raised in the Ozarks and my entire youth uh, through college was down in the Ozarks. And we were one of those families that hunted and gardened and foraged. And when I would go to school, uh, all my friends would be in the lunch line getting their hamburgers and pizzas. And my brother and I would have the brown paper sack with whatever mom had pickled, canned, or cured. And we were so embarrassed by that. We were the poor family that was embarrassed by what we were eating. And he said, to see you take those same ingredients that we were so embarrassed by and lift them up, not just to a meal, but to a tasting menu of a fine dining restaurant. He said, I don't know that you can fully appreciate what that means to someone like me and my family. Bullrush may be a new restaurant, but the food it's serving reaches back generations and generations. You know, we had this this 93-year-old. He came in with his grandson who had just graduated law school. This is the very first year we were open. And at the end of the meal, Grandpa called us over. He didn't talk to us the whole meal till then. And he said, I spent my entire life in the Ozarks. And he said, I didn't recognize a single thing you just served me. But every course reminded me of my childhood. Oh, come on. I mean, these are the things that feed us, but this is what we're talking about, right? I mean, it didn't matter that we made it like his wife made it or his grandmother made it. We gave him that sense of smell or that texture or that flavor that took him back 85 years. We all have that. I mean, as a food writer, it's one of those things where I thought I was going to be talking about, like, how a meal tasted and describing like food in a different way that would make people like really want to go eat it. And that's kind of part of it. But I realized probably several years into writing about food that the way more important story, I mean, the really the crux of why you do what you do is to be able to tell the story of the people who are making the food and the people that are enjoying the food, not necessarily the food itself. As a chef, I didn't take the traditional path, you know, and starting out as a raw food chef, everything that you have is a raw ingredient. So like if you need a cracker, you have to sprout your seeds and do all of those things. And it taught me to know where my food comes from and not be afraid of growing food and learning how to to use it. And so I think that when I see people Use those ingredients, those raw ingredients like that, and just be so creative with it. It's so freeing. And it it's not just freeing for us, it's freeing for all of us because your food does so much for you. And not just what it does for your body, but what it does for your mind and your spirit, you know? Sometimes sharing a meal can be so healing in so many ways that all of the guests that I spoke to today are so passionate about preserving food ways, preserving the knowledge of where our food comes from, that it makes me proud to be a Missourian. Hungry for Mo is a production of KCUR Studios with support from the Missouri Humanities Council. It's hosted by me, Jenny Vergara. And me, Natasha Bailey. This episode was written and produced by Suzanne Hogan with editing from Gabe Rosenberg and Mackenzie Martin. Sound design and mix by Suzanne Hogan and help from Paris Norvell. jean Viev de Marteau is the head of KCR Studios. Music this episode from Blue Dot Sessions. A special thanks this episode to Brian Munoz of St. Louis Public Radio, who took amazing photos of some of the food at Bull Rush, which you can see if you head to kcur.org slash hungry. And special thanks also to the Quapaw Nation and the Ozark Chickapin Foundation for even more photos. This is our last episode of season two, but we hope you've enjoyed this journey that we've been on. For more stories about the history of the state of Missouri, listen to the KCUR Studios podcast, A People's History of Kansas City. And stay in touch with KCUR at Twitter at KCUR and on Instagram at KCUR893. You can also find me on Instagram at EatableKC. And I'm on Instagram at JJ Vergara. I'm Jenny Vergara. And I'm Natasha Bailey. Eat well. <laughs>